but uh, a lot of, we're going to give you an opportunity to, to ask some questions, but you know, a lot of times people ask me, why would somebody who has had an illustrious medical career want to get into the dirty world of politics? <laughs> and I ask myself that every day too. <laughs> But really, it's because it is so important right now for the future of our country. And my, my whole career was spent trying to save the lives of children and trying to provide them with quality of life. And, um, you know, as I was nearing retirement, I started thinking about what kind of quality of life will they have if we continue on the course that we're on. And uh, I came to the understanding that it probably would not be a very good course. You know, uh, in 2013, when I was asked to speak at the National Prayer Breakfast, I was uh, kind of surprised that they asked me to do that, having done it before, in 1997. But that really kind of changed my life, because my retirement had to be put on hold after that because there were so many people clamoring for me to run for president, which I thought was a ridiculous idea. Uh, and I just said, well, this will, this will die down. But it didn't. And it kept building. And uh, telling me, elderly people telling me that before they heard me, they had given up on America. And they were just waiting to die. I heard that from so many different places. And it really scared me. And then a lot of this thing is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, a lot of young, younger people were also very concerned about what was going to happen to their children and to their grandchildren. And uh, that said to me as well. No. But I finally just said to the good Lord, you know, all the pundits say that this is impossible. It's impossible for a political novice to run president. You can't do it. You have no political organization. You can't put together a nationwide infrastructure. You can't raise adequate money. You're not connected to the money. It's just not going to happen. It's not even worth talking about. So, actually, it kind of comforted me to hear all that. <laughs> I said, well, great, then I won't have to worry about it. Uh, but I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this, you know, you know that it's virtually impossible, as they all say. But if you open the doors, I will walk through them. And um, he opened the doors. You know, uh, we were able to put together an incredible team nationally and uh, you know I absolutely refuse to bootleg billionaires and special interest groups to get their money I, I won't do that <laughs> but in fact we have received over 300,000 donations from ordinary American. You know, the average donation being $52. And uh, that's resulted in, in millions of dollars so that we can run the organization without special interest groups and without the billionaires that, that somebody talked about in the debates who expect you to do things for them. The only to work is that there would only be one special interest group and that would be the American people. That's the special interest that we all be taken care of. And the government also must once again be reminded that the government works for the people. The people don't work for the government. And somehow we've managed to get that all turned around. You know, it was Thomas Jefferson who predicted that we would end up in this situation. Uh, with this horrible microphone, that's what he said. <laughs> uh, somebody said I should hit it. Uh, 
better watch that person. Okay. <laughs> now, um, he said that the, the people of America would become less vigilant and uh, they would not be paying attention, they would not be informed, they would not be well educated, they would be more interested in the football game and who's on Dancing with the Stars. Now he didn't use those two examples. But, but you get the point. And he said as a result of that, the government would just grow and grow infiltrate every aspect of our lives and begin to control every aspect of our lives. But he said, before we turn into another form of government, the American people would awaken and they would regain control of the government. And I'm hoping that this is that time. Yeah. Right now. I'm afraid that if, it, if, it, if we don't wake up now and we get another progressive person in there who gets two or three Supreme Court picks, we're toast. And if we get somebody else in there who doesn't understand fiscal policy and continues to drive our debt, our foundation will collapse. And if we get somebody in there who thinks that ISIS and the radical jihadists are JV and are people that we don't have to worry about, we're toast. So this is, yeah, I know you've heard it before that this is a critical election, but I believe this is the most critical election. And really, we're in the same kind of battle that they were in the pre-revolutionary days. And the consequences for us are equally as dire. So we really are gonna to have to become extremely serious about this. Recognizing, for instance, that one of the things that threatens to destroy us is divisiveness. Extreme divisiveness on everything. And dishonesty and lying. You know, I, <laughs> I had to chuckle a little bit this morning because of all the articles that come out and say, Carson's doing fetal research and he wants Planned Parenthood to fund it, but he did fetal research, you know, based on a paper in 1992 in which my only role was to obtain tissue uh, from a tumor, a patient, and send it to the pathologist. The pathologist has to then compare that tissue with tissue bank. They have a tissue bank, which they maintain with people from conception to 110, 120 years old. Um, and they do that so that they can compare tissue specimens when they give them. I don't do any of that. I give them the tissue and I go on to the next patient. But no, Carson is engaged in fetal tissue uh, harvesting and, and uh, research on these fetuses. And just total crap and lies. But, uh, but, but this is what they do. And it's effective because people are uninformed and they just give them a bunch of lies. And that's, that's why one of the things that will be important in this election is for people to actually get to know the candidates themselves and know what kind of people they are. Because you really can't tell on the basis of the crap that the media comes up with because they have their own agenda. And, uh, you know, I have no doubt that with me continuing to rise in the polls, you know, they will be trying to find somebody I had a fight with in the third grade. <laughs> it's, uh, any, anything but talk about the real issues. And you know, one of the, the real issues is the divisiveness that's going on in our society. You know, we are dividing people into every category that we can. You know, this phony war on women, I think, is is 
absurd. You know, the relationship between a woman and the baby in her womb is a sacred relationship. There's, there's nothing closer than that. That woman has a natural inclination to protect that baby at all costs. I believe that's why God did it that way. Rather than have them grow on a plant or something, and you have to water the plant. No. Uh, it's in the safest place can possibly be. But we have reached a point in our society where people try to make you feel that that baby is the enemy of that woman. And that she has a right to kill it. And anybody who disagrees is engaged in a war on women. Now think about how distorted that thing is. A human being just kill it and not think about it. And yet, some of those very same people will march and protest and do everything imaginable because there's somebody building a road in an area where a snail darter might die. A snail darter who's considerably less complex physiologically than the baby in that mother's womb. Now think how asinine that is. I was talking to the head of the ACLU and uh, he was actually giving a talk. We were in another country. He was talking about how the ACLU is this wonderful, wonderful organization that speaks for people who cannot speak for themselves. And uh, I said, well, a woman came to me. She was 33 weeks pregnant. And uh, you know, the baby had hydrocephalus, so she was actually on her way. She had been counseled to go to Kansas to get an abortion. 33 weeks. That means that baby was viable outside of the womb without a respirator. But she stopped to see me before she went there, and fortunately I talked her out of it. And uh, she delivered the baby. We did an operation, and the baby's fine, and she's delighted that she did abort that baby. But I asked him, I said, uh, would you speak for that baby? That's a, that's a human being who has no one who can speak for it. Would you speak up for the rights of that baby? And he hemmed and awed and just couldn't come up with an answer. Later on that evening at dinner, he sat next to me and said, let me make it easy for you. In the neonatal intensive care unit, we have a lot of babies that are a lot younger than 32 weeks. 24, 25, 26, 27 weeks on an incubator getting maximum support. How about that baby? Could you advocate for that baby? Oh yeah, absolutely, no problem. I said, but the one that's 33 weeks, much further along developmentally, you can't advocate for it. He says, well, I know that doesn't make any sense. He says, but I actually believe that the mother has the right to kill that baby until the second it is born. And I said, would you say that in public? And he said, no. <laughs> but, you know, that's the kind of mentality that we're actually dealing with. But worse than that, or just equally as bad, is the fact that you have people who try to make people on different sides of that argument into bitter enemies who want to destroy them. That's where the problem lies. And anytime there's a racial incident with people of two races, it's got to be a new race war. There's racism rampant throughout our society. We're going to destroy ourselves with all this racism. The fact of the matter is, you're going to have conflicts when there are people. Whether they're of the same race or whether they're of different races. You're still going to have conflicts because people have conflicts with other people. And what we need to do instead, particularly you know, with regard to you know, the whole issue of Black Lives Matter, which has been you know, made very uh, prominent throughout the nation. I don't, I've never met anybody who didn't think Black Lives Matter. But what we really need to be talking about is adding a word to that phrase. 
the word all. All Black Lives Matter. Because in our major cities, inner cities, the number one cause of death for a young black man is homicide. And the vast majority of those homicides occur at the hands of other young black men, not at the hands of the police. And the number one cause of death in the black community is abortion. So do those lives matter? Yes. Should we be talking about maybe all rather than just some? And we should be looking at solutions rather than pointing fingers at them. You know, um, police go into these neighborhoods, they're intimidated. You act differently when you're intimidated. The young men in those neighborhoods, they're intimidated by the police, you act differently. How do you solve that problem? I think you have to introduce the police into those neighborhoods early and they have to be known. You know, like they used to have beat cops. And the people knew the police, and the police knew the people. So that little Johnny's first encounter with the police is somebody who's friendly, somebody who's playing ball with them, somebody who's doing something that he knows personally. And, uh, and that policeman also knows the people in that neighborhood. I've talked to a policeman recently in Baltimore. And, uh, you know, he, he frequents a particular neighborhood. He says he knows everybody there. They all love him. He says he never has a word about lunch or dinner. People are always inviting him in for lunch and dinner. You know, and, you know, that's what happens when people get to know each other. And they get to know each other as human beings, as relationships develop. This is what we need to be talking about, not pointing fingers at each other and exacerbating the situation and creating tension and creating violence. That has nothing to do with who we are as Americans. And then you have the class war. Always keep that on the front burner. If you read the writings of Saul Alinsky, who had written a book called Rules for Radicals, how to fundamentally change America, you will see that he and Lenin and some of the others say, in that process of change, you have to keep class warfare on the front burner at all times because there's always going to be more poor people than there are rich people, and you can make them resentful, and you can keep them on your side. And, uh, you know, that actually can work. And it's one of the reasons that those of us who actually love this country and don't want to see it torn apart have to be able to explain to people what is going on. You know, and one of the things that I am fond of doing is explaining to people who are downtrodden in our society that the way to success is not to tear down somebody else, but rather to use the God-given talents that you have to take advantage of what is around you. You know, you take, for instance, the proposal that I've made for income, income tax. I like the flat tax, I do, or the proportional tax, I do. I think that it is very fair, because God thought it was fair. And it seems to me like he's a pretty fair guy. You know, he said, I want a tie. He didn't say, if you have a bumper crop, you owe me triple tie. He didn't say, if your crops fail, you owe me nothing. Therefore, if, if he thinks proportional taxation or tithing is fair, I don't think I can do better than that. You make $10 billion a year, you pay a billion. You make $10 a year, pay one. You get the same rights and privileges. You, do, you get rid of all the deductions and all the loopholes so that you're revenue neutral. And uh, some people would say, well, that's not fair. Because the guy who put in a billion, he's still got nine billion left. That's not right. We need to take his money. We need to take more of his money. You know what that's called, don't you? Socialism. That's what it's called. And uh, the problem with that is next year, 
<laughs> he doesn't have a, a billion to get in because he doesn't have his 10 billion because you're trying to take all of his money. So not only do you not get as much money in your pot, but also now he's taking his money and he's trying to go somewhere with it and hide it. That's not helpful. The thing that got America to the pinnacle so fast was we had a different attitude. We said, that guy just put a billion dollars in the pot. Let's create an environment economically that will allow him to be even more successful next year so he can make 20 billion and put two billion dollars in the pot. That's how we grew so fast. And now we're not doing that. And we have to once again get that economic engine rolling again and let it expand, let that tide rise. Now that on the other end of the spectrum, there are those who say, well the guy who made $10, he can't afford to put a dollar in. Of course he can. Can he afford to drive on public highways? Can his kids go to public school? Yes, he can afford to pay his share. And it's not a very big share, but it's a proportional share. I think that's why God did it that way. And having grown up in dire poverty, I can tell you a lot of people who live in poverty actually have pride. They don't want you to pat them on the head and say, there, there, you poor little thing. I'm taking care of all of your needs. What they would rather you do is fix the economy so they can get a good job and move up the ladder and become part of the fabric of America. That's what we have to begin to concentrate on. Also, if you exempt a certain portion of the population from paying taxes, then they don't have skin in the game. But you know, it's much harder for politicians to engage in their favorite activity, raising taxes, when everybody is involved. You know, if you can just involve 1%, 2%, or 5%, it's easy. But if it's 100%, you gotta explain to 100% of the people why you're raising their taxes. You're probably not gonna raise their taxes. And that's what you have to think about. And, and that's why our system works best when we treat everybody the same. When we start having special people, that's a problem. That's one of the reasons I say, yes, our government is much too big also. We need to shrink our government, but we need to do it across the board, across the entire spectrum. Uh, if I were president, I would call all departmental directors and I would say we need two to three percent cut this year, and the next year, and the next year. And if you can't do that, you may as well turn in your resignation now because you're going to be fired. And I think that's what you have to do. Everybody. only one exception because it's already been cut so severely and that's the military. <laughs>